everybody. This is Samuel Fisher from Green Dispensary Marketing. Good to be back with you guys with another guest. Uh, this is Ryan from Dispo Joy. Very excited to have him. He runs an SMS, MMS marketing agency for cannabis dispensaries. He's got lots of great information and insight for us on the current and future trends for SMS and MMS marketing in the cannabis industry. How are you doing today, Ryan? I'm doing great. It's Monday. You know, uh, it was a fun weekend. Um, a lot of texts getting out, a lot of people buying weed. So I think that's uh, that's why I'm here to kind of talk about that. So I appreciate uh, you letting me jump on and uh, and chat with you. Awesome. Well, let's get right into this. Uh, could you just to start off? Uh, my first question is about you personally. Can you tell me a little bit more about you and your personal journey as an entrepreneur? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, I think for me, you know, my my path to entrepreneurship was kind of um, indirect. I didn't definitely didn't have an entrepreneurial bug when I was kind of going through the ranks of the cannabis industry. Uh, I knew I wanted to get in cannabis, but I didn't think about like creating my own, you know, my own jobs, my own type of business around it. I did. I think uh, for me, once the cannabis industry started, you know, I was working for a company called Leafly. A lot of people know that company um, was doing a lot of ad sales for them. Um, and then I <laughs> sort of ironically was uh, the CBD market was starting to grow at that point. And I kind of got a little bit of entrepreneurial bug there and I was sort of uh, I, I found a CBD oil supplier and I was I was selling it to old ladies on golf courses for fun, you know, and uh, little things. Like that's where I kind of got the bug was sort of getting into cannabis, realizing the opportunities that were there to kind of maybe establish something for myself. And um, I think ultimately the transition, though, I kind of gave up. CBD didn't work out because it became very competitive really quickly. And so I was like, all right. So I then I focused on you know working in uh, I wanted to work in technology, started working at Spring Big on uh, SMS marketing, loyalty software company for dispensaries. Um, and then I think through that, you know, you start to kind of see there's a lot of issues and a lot of problems that need solving around SMS. There's a lot of challenging um, uh, issues around, you know, deliverability, uh, promoting cannabis content, right? And I think the restrictions around that, you start to see there's a lot of challenges. And so I think through that, a good entrepreneur obviously creates a business around solving a problem at the end of the day. And so when I honed in on, what problem can we solve for the cannabis space? And I think that kind of set me on the path to creating Dispo Joy, my my agency, um, and really helping dispensaries just get the most ROI, maximize results, send texts that work, send texts that get to the phone in a traditional cannabis way. And I think for us, that's the that's the path that we've set, um, and we're really excited about it. But definitely a roundabout. I was never an entrepreneur, and I think for me, it just sort of became that way as I started to kind of realize, okay, there's a problem that needs to be solved here doesn't look like anybody's really trying to solve it. And, you know, maybe I should. And I think that whether that's too much confidence or not, um, there's a level of uh, expertise that comes into play there. But I think for me, it's all about just, just helping this industry and helping dispensaries uh, flourish in the future. And I think uh, we're, we're lucky enough to uh, have the opportunity to do that. So that's, that's all we're trying to do is create an opportunity. So yeah, awesome. Great response. I think you're actually kind of jumping into my second question here. Uh, what inspired you to start Dispo Joy? Yeah, you know, Dispo Joy sort of started um, with the effect that a lot of folks who were using Spring Big, for example, um, either didn't have the bandwidth to get the really good results or just it didn't have the expertise potentially to get the results that they were hoping for. Because um, Spring Big is, you know, it's a pretty complex platform, m much like others in the space where there's a lot of data. It's a CRM tool and understanding how to get the best ROI, who you should be texting, how often, all that kind of stuff. And so we found that if we could help dispensaries in a much more direct way, rather than telling them what to do, what if we just did it for them? So that was, that was the first iteration of Dispo Joy and just thinking, all right, I, people don't need to hear more stuff. They're too busy focused on, on their employees, procuring product, trying to keep their business afloat, like having to worry about the marketing tech and how to use it and how to maximize it just I feel like was getting a little bit of afterthought. And so what if we were to kind of come in and just do it for them, knowing that we kind of know the secret sauce to making it work. And then I think Dispo Joy sort of started to transition into this, well, there's a, still a lot of challenges with cannabis texting in terms of being able to say what you want to say, promoting your brand on it, not getting blocked by carrier restrictions, spam filtering. And so we sort of transitioned into sort of having our own platform at the end of the day where people could send that kind of traditional text messaging that they see with every other business that they, they probably know whether it's shoes or apparel, right? Uh, you know, coffee shops that have SMS capabilities that are much more direct and traditional. 
And I think for us, that was the moment where we realized, okay, that's another problem to solve rather than just doing one set thing of helping them get the results they want. What if we could take things in a step further and you know help them navigate those challenges around deliverability, effectiveness, things like that. And so that's where DispoJoy is now, where we've just kind of moved towards this direct marketing channel to make SMS viable. Um, so that's, that's, mo- that's much more fun. Like it's much more exciting to get like a direct weed text in your phone with a good deal or a good impression or a good image of product that I think just speaks volumes of like, people want to see that they just weren't getting it before. And I think that's where we're really excited about the opportunity. Yeah. And I think really anybody who's a consumer in the cannabis industry, especially those who opt in don't really mind getting those text messages. And it kind of brings me into my next question. Um, As you know, a lot of these carriers have had some pullbacks on our text messages in this industry. Uh, what do you think is the best way to ensure text messages get sent? Yeah, it's a loaded question. Um, I'll try to answer it in so succinct that way it doesn't bore people. Yeah, of <laughs> course. Yeah, you don't need to go on a huge tangent either. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, so there's so much, I think, what, people, what dispensaries really need to know, the core thing about texting in cannabis is that it's not that the carriers don't like the cannabis it's all about spam filtering. Email too. People have seen, you know, email rates get, get sent to spam filters even more so. Other like normal businesses too, right? Through the, you know, through Google and, and Microsoft changing their spam filtering laws. So it's harder to email now too. The last few years, texting has been hard because there's not really a set path for a dispensary to have a legal channel. The phone carriers set up what they would call a very a, a legal throughput channel where you can register basically for a marketing approval with a 10 digit phone number or a short code. Well, cannabis can't do that. So you're playing in this black market text marketing game, right? Which is what, you know, maybe you get political texts, maybe you get spam phishing texts. Like people get fake spam texts all the time. That's what we're playing with right here in cannabis. Everything in cannabis is not, you know, it's all gray. It's all black market to a certain degree. And I hate using the term black market because it makes it sound legal. It's not that it's illegal, but I think for the most part, the way to make texting work is to understand, okay, if we can understand about three things that allow us to do this, one is the health of the number. Will that number deliver the message to the phone? Because the carriers, when they block a number, that number is bad. You can't use it again. That's like, they're too smart. You can't, you know, at the end of the day, it's numbers. If that number has been flagged, that 10 digits it's not going to work ever again, but they're not going to tell you why that is. So one, being able to test the health of the number first is the most key component before you send a message. Number two, did it get sent to your phone in a test, right? Like I think the issue where a lot of people are uh, you seeing right now is they'll send out a message and they won't get it. Well, if they're not getting it, how do they know their customer's getting it, right? And I think at that point, we just have built a system where you need to send it to yourself first. Like you need to get it physically in your phone. If you don't, then that number is not good. It's about, once again, health of the number. It's sort of testing the the viability of the number. So that's really two. And then number three, I think, is being able to monitor the, the throughput of that and understanding the pattern recognition around cannabis content. Like I mentioned, it's about spam. If your text message does not look like a spam text, meaning it's just a little bit of copy and like a, a weird looking link, that looks like spam to the carriers. If it doesn't look like a normal text, of like peer to peer, me texting you, hey, Sam, what's up? You know, are you free this Friday? Not putting a weird looking link in there. Like that, that doesn't look like spam. That will go through. Now, peer to peer, that's a different channel altogether. So we're not, that's, don't equate that. But from a marketing perspective, we want to make these texts look so good, look so clean and professional that these carriers don't really think about the cannabis in them. They just want to know if it's spam or not. So to kind of wrap this question up a little bit, is the number unhealthy that you're using? Have you tested its health before you actually send it to 10,000 people knowing it's going to be effective and reach their phones? And three, we understand the pattern recognition of don't make it look like spam. Make it look really good and clean. Look like a professional cannabis message, right? Where you're, you know, it's not too salesy. You're not putting a bunch of, you know, a tons of items on for sale and and putting a bunch of you know, spam looking language, percentage signs and dollar signs. Like that's more important in terms of like having a picture of a nug on there or some concentrate or or your name or the name of your brand. 
right? Like that's, it's an entirely different game that we're thinking about as opposed to let's restrict cannabis. No, let's go heavy on cannabis and let's restrict the spam content. And that I think keeps the channel really kind of clean at that point. If you have all three of those things, you can get these cannabis texts delivered really, really well. And the more your customers get them, the more they're going to buy from you. And I think that's really the sort of the key component with all that. Yeah, great information. Thank you for that. Thank you for also summarizing at the end. Uh, kind of leads me leads me into my next question. Uh, how do you make SMS and MMS messages that you know will convert into an ROI, not just get delivered? Yeah, the first part of your question there, SMS only, which is text without, without an image. So MMS, for people who yeah, don't know, MMS, that. right? Yeah, it's an image, right? And you can put some copy below that image. People send pictures all the time. But those are two different channels. SMS, if you're using unregistered numbers, which all of us are in cannabis, right? SMS doesn't work. It just doesn't work because it immediately gets flagged as spam, right? So those numbers, if you send something out, that number will just get blocked as spam, mm-hmm. right? Ultimately. So because you have to put a link in there to kind of get them to a landing page. So, but MMS with an image, that's filtered differently than just SMS. So for us, we only use MMS because we want to put images in there, which obviously a picture says a thousand words, right? You can say more with the picture than you can by just sort of saying it in text copy. But we obviously do both. We want to have an image and a text box, but the throughput is different there. So that I think for us is from an ROI perspective, there are different things that you can do when you use an image like that and you're using a specific promo code or something like that in the text box, right? With the link directly to your website or our landing page conversion page. So what a lot of our clients will do is you can track ROI through, say you're sending a text to a thousand people, like a win back campaign, Hey, a 60 day inactive win back campaign. And you're targeting those customers with an exclusive 20% off promo code to use on any product or, Hey, if you spend 50, you get 20% off something like that. Well, at that point, within a 24-hour period, you can track the redemption rates of, yeah. of that coupon, uh-huh. right? So that's one. Um, obviously, we're, you know, we're, there's a lot of, I think, manipulation of data when it comes to ROI from a lot of these other CRM platforms. Because if you send a text to somebody and it doesn't get it to their phone, they didn't see it, but they came in anyway by chance, they'll attribute that ROI to that text. It's like, well, the guy didn't actually see the text. So how do you know how effective it is? So I think for us... We like to look at the website conversion. We like to put the dispenser's website in the text itself to sort of look at the web traffic that kind of came from that. Are people getting to the landing page? Are they converting in that landing page? Is there a funnel there that's set forth? That way you can track each step of the level. Are people falling off? And then to have that redemption code that's exclusive to that audience, looking at the redemption rate of that. And then that just kind of gives a nice picture of a, like a, you know, it's an ad. That's all it is, is the ad converting, Right. And I think that for us is really the, that's the most important component of knowing, is this message effective? Because if you're going to send an audience to a, a win back campaign to a folks who are, haven't visited in six months and you get one person out of a thousand, all right, it didn't really convert that well. Is it the ad or was it the text? And I think for us, it's like, well, I think the ad needed to be, be, needed to be better. Like, let's not blame the texting ultimately that the texting doesn't work. That's not it at all. Texting does work. It's the content. Is the content good enough? Is the promotion good enough? Yeah. Are those the things that are uh, are happening? And so that's where we take a little bit of that work on for the dispensary where we don't want them kind of guessing. Like we ultimately know what kind of stuff converts, right? This kind of discounts but based on the audience, right? So I think for us, that's where we bring a little bit of that expertise as an agency, quote unquote, as our own platform. Where we can recommend to people, hey, it's Friday. You know, let's take a win back campaign. It's, it's payday. Let's try to get some people back into the fold who haven't been shopped in a while and really sort of go at it. Let's, let's do something that they haven't really, they can't say no to as opposed to like a 10% off coupon. That's probably not going to convert very well. So I think for you, if you can get them roped back into your loyalty program or, you know, content and organic content in general, that's a great way to kind of have that engaged audience consistently. But if you want to track ROI from a specific campaign, well, you're going to want to see its viability. If you're going to send it to a guy who visited yesterday, he's probably not going to come in. But you know that if the guy has been inactive for 60 days and all these other influential messages hasn't done anything for him, then you may as well shoot your shot and try to do something that's so unique where it's like, all right, how can they say no to that? And then understand, okay, it's about the message. It's not about the texting or the email. It's about can you convince that customer and influence them with the value that you're trying to offer them? 
to get them to make a call to action to say, all right, I'm going to do something about it today. I'm going to come shop at the store. I'm going to take advantage of this deal because, you know, I don't know how often this will come by again. And that's kind of how we like to uh, sort of approach things with texting. Yeah, thank you. Great, great response. Uh, to kind of lead to the next question, I think one thing Ryan and I both agree on is that we're not really here to cut down or criticize other people in this marketing space. Uh, we actually really value all the contributions that other companies make in this space. Uh, that being said, what do you think makes Dispo Joy stand apart or stand out when compared to other people in this space? Yeah, that's a great question. We've... Uh... <laughs> Uh, a, a, a guy asked that question at, 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 the, uh, at the, the trade show out in Boston, the, the NECAN event last weekend. Like, like what's separate? Like, like, why should we work with you? Right? Like, what's, like, what, like, what's your pitch? And a lot of the times my pitch is like, well, I mean, you probably shouldn't. Right? And they're, like, so they're taken aback by that. Like, well, you probably might. You probably shouldn't, to be honest with you. Because for us, what we're doing at Dispo Joy as a texting platform and a managed service we can't work with everybody. We just can't. Like, like, there's no way we can work with hundreds of dispensaries because in order to make texting work, like I mentioned earlier, it has to be curated. It has to be tested. It has to put in like manual effort. A text to 20,000 people, like a blast, that, that could take up to an hour of throughput. That could take up to an hour to go all the way completed. If you're not hand-holding that content the all the way through, maybe pausing the campaign in the middle of it when you see – the ability rates have dropped a little bit, right? If we're, if we're, if, if we're not maintaining a 95% deliverability rate, I'll pause it and I'll start again and I'll, I'll change the ad and then I'll resume sending to the rest of the people knowing that, okay, if I keep going, more, you know, it, maybe it's 90, maybe it's 85, maybe it's 80% deliverability overall at the end. I don't want that. I want to make sure all these guys get the message. And so little things like that where rather than saying we're the best, well, we're not. We have the most data. We don't. We don't, we don't have all these things, these bells and whistles that maybe others in the space do. But the work we're doing is we're probably the only <clears throat> company in the industry that's doing texting and managing the texting at the same time. That's what makes DispoJo unique. Because rather than saying, hey, click a button and hope it works, that's not how this game goes right now. If you're clicking a button and you're hoping that it's going to work, it's not going to work. That That's not how this is. Like you, you won't be able to have the maximum opportunity to get the most text delivered if you do that. And that's not to say that the companies out there that have that ultimately that's a problem for them because it's not a it's it can always adapt to things. Things could are always changing in cannabis and you have to be open to that. Things could get worse, things could get better, and that's just the nature of our business. But for right now in this moment in time, if a business is struggling to get text delivered, it's partly because they might need a service that is just going to do it for them and make sure that it works and do what it takes to get it to work. And the effort around that is not like it's tiny. Like for us to send a text to, to 30,000 people for a dispensary or even, even 300 people, it does take time and energy. It's not a simple click of a button to make it viable. And so for us, if people need something that's quick and easy, then we are not for them. If they just want to hope that it's going to work, we are not for them. So when people ask me what makes us different, like not a lot makes us different. We're just willing to do the work ultimately to, to establish like a viability for it. And I think that's a very, people are, I think are, I think like that response, it's, it's authentic. It's transparent. It's not like, we're not trying to, we're not trying to lie to you. We're just trying to say, Hey, like if you need something that works, that's where we come in. And I think ultimately the uniqueness of it all is that we do have our own platform that we can also handhold these campaigns through and make sure that they're viable. But outside of that, like if a dispensary doesn't, doesn't want to put in the work for something, then that's where we're also an option. Like let us do the work, right? Ultimately that's, I think the, the, the soft pitch at the end of the day. Yeah. Great response. Um, let's jump over to kind of focusing on people who are new in the industry. As I, I'm sure you have many people that are following you uh, that are maybe just starting a cannabis dispensary or looking into doing so. And they might be listening to this, uh, maybe thinking about hiring you in the future, uh, but maybe they don't have the the money to kind of give uh, over to you right mm -hmm. away. Uh, what kind of ideas and strategies would you give to them that they can implement right now uh, before they can eventually come to you? Yeah, it's actually a great question. And we've you know, we ultimately Dispo Joy is much more, I think, aligned towards 
the stores that have been using text marketing for a long time and just need better results. Whereas if you're a new location, if you're just starting out, we definitely like what we typically offer is we will consult with you for free. Like we will tell you all the tricks that you need to do to set things up for success over the next few months. So a lot of the, our pitch is like just and then then let us know when you're ready to sort of do the work uh, that you need the work done. But I think for us, you know, it all starts with with understanding one key component. If you're a dispensary, there are three price levers in the industry that have been set up for you to be successful. One, if customers order online, they spend more than in store. That's price level number one. Number two, if they use some form of payment card, debit, for example, or credit, if it's, you know, if it's legal or not, right? <laughs> That's a wishy-washy area. They spend more average, average tickets higher, right? So and then number three is if they're often into texting, they visit more often. And that's really key for dispensaries to understand. It's not email. It's not mobile app. If a customer is often in your texting program or text rewards program, they will spend more money with, they have a higher lifetime value, right? That's because they're visiting more often. Therefore, they're spending more money, right? So your perfect customer Venn diagram, three circles here is they order online, they pay with their card, and they get your tax. So if you're a dispensary out the gate, that's everything from a customer journey perspective. What can you do to manipulate, not manipulate, but influence a customer to order online, use their debit card, and stay opted into your sign up for one, opt into your text program, and stay opted into your program. Because it's per compliance, they, they can just opt out whenever. You have to give them the opportunity. But if you can keep them motivated to stay invested into that program, whatever you have to do, whether it's like giving them exclusive stuff, they get things that they couldn't get by just walking in. They just You have to make it fun. You have to make it unique to their experience and that they get more out of shopping at your store by being opted into your program. If you can solve that equation as a new store, you are going to make more money than your competitor. Flat out. And you have to, you don't have to do anything at that point. You don't have to really spend any more money ultimately on marketing. You just need to get people to come into your store with good SEO, right? I'm talking about you. At the end of the day, once you get them in there, capture them, keep them in there and keep them ultimately bought into the program. There are different ways to do that, that I could go on for an hour about how to do that. But I think those are the three things that in this little short soundbite that we could put in is texting is valuable as a long time, lifetime value opportunity. It's not about that one single text. It's knowing that over the course of the lifetime value, right? Lifetime value, LTV, or they want to call it, right? It's a big metric that doesn't get talked about in cannabis a lot. If they're opting into texting, they have a higher lifetime value than if they're opted out of texting. And I think that's, do what you got to do to figure that out. Do what you have to do to keep that customer opted in and to make sure that this text programs are valuable. We consult with dispensaries all the time on how to do that. And we do not charge for that. So anybody can reach out to me through you or me directly. And I will happily give them that blueprint for free. It does. I, I, I want them to see that because ultimately everything that we know about how to make texting work in terms of the deliverability, the ad creation, that's not like, let us handle that. Let us do that nuanced work. But for you in the store, you're, you're focused on customer experience. And I think at that point, there's a clear blueprint on how to do that and to make SMS successful as a marketing channel to have this revolving door of this, this customer cycle, Right. And I think loyalty rewards is a big component of that, but it's all a part of the, the, the customer journey that you have to build out. And if you're a new store, you're just, well, why try to figure that out over the next six months to a year? Why not just get that info right away and have success? That way in six months, you're flourishing. And as your new customer acquisition kind of comes down, your retention engine is just rolling and you're good to go. That's when people can talk to us to go, hey, I, I need people to manage the texting side, the retention side, the outward marketing that's where we get, but you can, you can do all that ahead of time for free. And I think that's really what I want stores to understand. It does not cost you money ultimately to have that blueprint. And I will happily give you that blueprint. Awesome. Yeah. So you're, you're doing a great job of kind of cutting into my next questions. Um, I don't know if you're <laughs> sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. intuitively knowing what I'm going to say or whatever, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, and so I just actually have one more question now. I was going to ask about the steps that dispensary could take, but I think you answered that pretty well already. Mm -hmm. a new dispensary could take for implementing their new SMS strategy. I got one more question for you. I understand we're also going a little over time here. I definitely respect your time. Thanks for staying a little late. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for new players entering the cannabis industry in 2024? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. The new advice, if I was being transparent, I would say 
Just don't enter the space. <laughs> don't space. Just don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. But I'll tell you, all right, all right, I'll, I'll back up. Oh, that was funny. It's, right? <laughs> it's not that you shouldn't actually do it. I, you know, I think people, they see cannabis, and I've been in this industry for a decade now, and we've seen a lot of people come and go. I've been through a lot of ups and downs personally in my life, in my career, getting laid off multiple times, thinking that, you know, I, I think when, when I got hired at Leafly, I thought I had it made. I was like, heck yeah, I made it to a Leafly recognizable brand. And then it just all came crashing down and it just kind of went away. And you start to realize how volatile this industry is. I've been through multiple layoffs in this industry, partly why I wanted to be an entrepreneur, because I wanted to kind of control my own destiny a little bit yeah, and solve that. problems that I felt like only I can solve. Yeah. Right. And help dispensaries solve those problems too and help them flourish. So when I say don't get in the industry, I don't literally mean don't get in, but prepare yourself for a lot of challenges. This, you know, you, you look on LinkedIn and you see a lot of these people who have a vast experience, how much struggles they go through to get where they're at. And it's like an entrepreneur should struggle. You're, it's not meant to be easy. It's not meant to be this cakewalk. Um, but I think if you're looking to get in the space, you're, you're looking at it with, with rose colored glasses and it's not that at all. It is a grind. You're going to have business challenges that you did not expect. Even if you're an entrepreneur before this and you've run successful businesses before, cannabis is a whole other animal. And if, you're, uh, if you've been in the industry, whether you're a grower or anything like that, like you don't have a lot of business acumen that will prepare you for what's to come. And I think that's kind of where we're at right now. And I think a lot of people are who got in the industry a long time ago, they're looking to get out. They might not say it outwardly, but they're looking to sell their licenses. They have sold their licenses. You know, you've seen a lot of consolidation in the industry. Um, so my advice is not that you shouldn't literally get in the industry per se, but you need to be you need to be well funded. You need to be you need to be a a a long term you know satisfaction person. You cannot have instant gratification. Um, you need to obviously be able to to read people and trust people to know who can help you grow this. You can't do it alone. And so if you're alone, if you're a solo person who's just really confident about building a business, I would say stay out of the cannabis, stay out because it's not going to be worth it. Go do something else with your brain power and your expertise and your skills. Go do another industry that is well suited for your skills. Cannabis is, I think, something that people need to understand. There's a lot of opportunity. Well, the gold rush was a lot of opportunity and you saw how that turned out, right? Cannabis is not, it's not that much different. There's, they said that people people see dollar signs because America loves its drugs, and I think ultimately people are always going to buy weed, right? But you see things like people were unprepared for price deflation; they weren't prepared for that. Like, how could you not be prepared for that in a saturated industry? And all of a sudden, you're like, you have spent thousands of dollars, millions of dollars on on, on canopy growing. You've got the black market to, to, to contend with at the same time. You've got each state laws are restrictive; they're all different. You know, the taxes are like half of your money goes to taxes. If I didn't know it was cannabis, if there was a case study that goes like, hey, would you buy into this business? And if I didn't know it was cannabis, I would say, heck no. 50% tax rate, F that, right? R restrictions and regulations, F that. So that's why I say, if you want to get in the cannabis space, you got to have really thick skin or you got to have the best freaking weed that we've ever seen <laughs> in the day to help you differentiate. But I will say this to kind of wrap this up on a more positive front because I don't want to be negative Nancy because I'm, I'm in this industry. I want people to, to you know, use our service. I want people to sell more wheat, right? But the one thing that I like to talk about is if you're going to get in this industry, if I'm going to give you real, real advice, hone in on a demographic of customer or your product. And what I mean by that is I'm in my, my mid-30s. I'm a millennial, Right. I don't smoke weed every day anymore, right? You know, like hats off to the millennials, right? And I, and I don't, you know, I love weed. I, I used to smoke a lot of weed, but I don't anymore. And so my, my trends and my tastes have changed as I've gotten older. I've got kids, I've got married, I've got, you know, a mortgage, right? Like yeah. you can't be smoking weed all the time. No. So if you are a brand and you see that, okay, what if, you know, I, I typically, as a customer, I, I'm buying a vape pens more consistently than I am flour. I don't have time to smoke all this flour. I just don't. And so for me, like I like the brands that are giving me an experience that 
are more curated toward like on the branding side. So there's, you know, for example, there was a brand that we saw at, um, at Hall of Flowers in California a couple weeks ago. And it was like called high nineties. And it was just like, I- I'm a nineties kid. The branding resonated a little bit with the nineties culture, right? The vape pen was a really smooth disposable hit. Really good. It, the high is really good. It's very chill. It's like, okay. Like, and the price point was pretty good too, but it's a little more higher value, higher value as a price point, but that's okay for me. I'm willing to spend a little bit more because I'm not buying it all the time on a brand that I resonate with. And if you're a new brand in this industry, that's what you have to figure out. What does your brand represent? Who do you want to target as a demographic? Do you want to target the everyday smoker, right? Who's looking for the, for, for that cheap weed ultimately on the, on the budget. Do you want to, do you want to be an edible company that you're, you're looking to target those soccer moms who buy every now and then a bag of edibles to share with, with, with all their gal pals at tea parties, right? That's okay too. Hone in on some demographic that you feel like you can connect with, whether you are that age, whether you that resonates with you as a millennial as well. You, we don't see that a lot right now. A lot of the marketing is we had the best weed. We had the cheapest weed. That's about it. And I think for the smart brands that are going to be here in the next 10, 20, 30 years – are going to be the ones that didn't try to go over the entire market, but they went after a small little sliver of it and really had great business practices around make sure that they're profitable, they're not overspending, and that their customers love their product and are buying it over and over and over again. It's consumption. It's it's ultimately uh, you know it's a product that if people aren't buying it over and over again, you're not going to be in business, right? You're going to have to just try to find new demographics to buy it. But if you could hone in, if you're a new business owner, you if you could hone in on that one sliver and do that really, really well and have really effective marketing towards a demographic, I think you'll be really successful. It won't be easy, but that's the positive take that I think there's opportunity there because not a lot of brands are doing that. They're not honing in. Whether high 90s is thinking about that, maybe they are, maybe they're not. But if they are, good for them because I think that's what they need to double down on. And if they're not, Hopefully they'll see this and go, okay, this, this, this guy knows what he's talking about. We need to sell more to that guy. We need to sell more to Ryan because ultimately that's who's resonating with our product. And we should double down on that and try to get him to buy more and more and more over time. So cannabis is a commodity. And if you're willing to play the commodity game, I think you'll be successful at that in that essence. Yeah, once again, this is Ryan Stewart. Uh, he's the CEO of Disco Joy. Do you have any final words for everybody? Do you want to say how you can get in touch with you? Yeah. Um, well, the one thing I'll say is, you know, which I like, this is part of my philosophy is just don't settle. Just don't settle. We don't have time to settle. Right. Like we don't, this industry isn't going to be here forever for you. Right. It's just not, it's going to, it's going to go on without you. And if you settle whether it's settling on product quality, settling on people that work for you, settling on services that you use, if you settle, then everything else about your business is going to settle. And I think people in this industry have to just, you got to keep going. You have to keep grinding, but don't settle at the same time. And I think that's my, that's my only advice I can give people right now is if you're unhappy, if you're struggling, great. Everybody else is too. You are not the only one, right? Don't feel alone in that. You know, that you're, that you're a struggling business or you're a successful business because it comes and goes. You might think you're on top of the world. Like a lot of these businesses were a few years ago and now they're just struggling to get by. And so I think the nature of this industry is just, you just can't settle right now. You have to do what you have to do to sell more product and don't settle for what you're doing right now, but be willing to change and mix it up. Do better SEO, get more text delivered, right? Get your website, make your website look better. Like everything, you know, ultimately through that customer journey that we talked about, like don't settle, go out and get it, go out and grab it. Don't wait for it to happen to you because it's not going to happen in your, in this industry. Um, yeah, if people want to hit us, obviously, you know, dispojoy.com. Um, you know, obviously, uh, I have my own. I'm on LinkedIn pretty often. Uh, Brian Stewart at Dispo Joy. Um, people are always willing to hit me up. Um, it's been quite, I, I like to give free advice. Like I said, I'm not looking to charge for anything other than text messages. So I think for us, like we want people to know these blueprints. So I'm always happy to. If people want to email me, ryan at dispojoy.com. You know, I will happily give people the blueprint for success that I've used, that I've seen through years and years of collecting data around SMS and loyalty capabilities. Um, I want people to have free access to that and feel like they have an opportunity where, hey, if we, do, if we do these core things, we're going to have a successful dispensary. We're going to have a successful cannabis brand. And I think a lot of folks 
don't know what to do because they feel like they're getting conflicting advice everywhere else. So always happy to at least lend that to people if they need it. Um, and then hopefully if they, if they like that advice then they'll, they'll want us to kind of maybe do their text for them as well. But um, yeah, I really appreciate uh, you know you having me on and, and, and asking some great questions and I'm excited for people to um, like I said, keep grinding it out and just know there's hope. There's I don't want to be like the negative Nancy again. I think there is hope here, but it's hard work. And at the end of the day, if you don't have time to put on that hard work, then you need to hire people who are willing to do that. I think that's where we feel really confident that we're a great partner and that we're willing to do the work that they need, but it's not for everybody. And if they don't want to have that kind of hard work on their side, that's okay, but it's not easy and people shouldn't sugarcoat it. And I think that's really the nature of, uh, of cannabis right now. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Ryan. Definitely wish you the best um, and hopefully we'll be in touch in the future. Yeah, no, appreciate it, Sam. Excited to be in front of your audience. And uh, yeah, looking forward to talking again. Awesome. We have-